Hi, everybody. Welcome to Comic-Con. Uh, the name of our panel today is uh, Let's Make a Comic. And we basically have uh, five fantastic, well, four fantastic Emmy uh, creators who do kids comics for Random House Graphic. That's sort of our overarching umbrella through all the different uh, publishing houses we're part of. And today we have some really talented folks that we're going to be basically putting a comic together based on prompts that we set up with each other. So one person's gonna draw a page and then the next person may draw the next part of the story. And nobody knows where it's going to start and where it's going to end, except for me. Uh, so I'm gonna start off by introducing uh, the uh, creators. And if you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself as well as the book that you are uh, doing right now and, and we can go from there. So I'm gonna start with uh, Sophie Iskabas. Hi, Sophie. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. So my name is Sophie Escabas, indeed. I'm the author of The Witches of Brooklyn that came out uh, last year. Uh, it's the story of this young girl, Effie, who arrives in Brooklyn and ends up living in with her uh, great old aunts who turn up to be witches and she's going to discover an all new world of witchy and fun and exciting and new. And the next one is coming at the end of the summer and I'm working right now on the third one. And I have another book that just came out that I didn't wrote, but I, I drew uh, called um, Tomoko Takes the Lead by the very, um, very, um, uh, that, oh, I, I think, sorry, oopsie, oopsie, sorry about that. So yeah, the Derby Daredevil series, sorry about that. That comes out, that just came out. Here you go. Sorry, that was a bit chaotic. <laughs> That's okay. We thought maybe one of uh, your witchy creations came came and no, I have cats, I have kids. It's it's quite bit sorry. Oh, that's okay. I think I think that is part of the fun of the Zoom experience. So, uh, and next we'll head over to uh, Savannah Ganesho. Yes. Hey. Um. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Savannah Ganesho. Uh, I'm the adapter of the graphic novel Turtle in Paradise that was written originally as a novel by Jenny Holm. Um, so I took that novel and made it a comic book script and then I drew that book, um, which was super fun. And it's um, a middle grade novel that takes place in the great during the Great Depression. Um, Turtle's mom can't afford to have her anymore. So she goes down to Key West, Florida to live with her cousins and her aunt and they get all up to all kinds of hijinks and it's really fun and cute. Um, and yeah. That's pretty much what I've been working on. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Savannah. And uh, let's move over to Rich Moyer. Hello, everybody. Um, I am on my first book. I've got a three book deal. Let's see if I can hold this up the right way. Uh, first one's Ham Helsing. Oh, they're all Ham Helsing, but they're different adventures of, of such. So this is my first one. It just came out two days ago. So mm -hmm. it is currently the best-selling book of all time and the biggest bomb of all time, all at the same time, because, you know, we were, uh, it's all going great, but, you know, two days in, so what can you say? Um, it's really an underdog story of a, a poetic, soft pig and a family of very uh, aggressive male masculinity sort of line of pigs, so he's kind of, the, he's the last pig standing and he has to hold up the family tradition of hunting vampires. So. Very cool. Thanks, Rich. Sure. And let's head over to Jeffrey Brown. Hi, um, I'm Jeffrey Brown. And most people know me for my Star Wars books like Darth Vader and Son and Jedi Academy. But more recently, I've done a couple uh, series of graphic novels with Random House, starting with Lucy and Andy Neanderthal, about a brother and sister living 40,000 years ago. And just to go way in the opposite end of time, um, slightly in the future uh, is Once Upon a Space Time. It's the first book that came out last year. And um, the next book is A Total Waste of Space Time, which will be out about uh, four weeks from now. So I don't even have a copy yet. <laughs> well, well, that's great. We're all looking forward to that. And uh, and just for anybody who doesn't know me, uh, my name is John Gallagher. I'm a cartoonist and 
uh, currently the uh, creator of the Max Meow uh, Cat Crusader series, which is also from Random House Graphic. And it's the story of a superhero cat, his best friend who's a scientist, and trying to keep the city of Kittyopolis uh, safe and furry. And uh, I think, uh, as you can see, there is a theme of uh, fun and humor in a lot of what we're doing and excitement for middle grade, uh, which if you're not familiar with that sort of uh, hoity-toity term of middle grade, it's, you know, elementary school. It could be six to nine and seven to 10. And, you know, it really varies. But if, if your kids are in elementary school, then they're probably going to enjoy these books and maybe even beyond. Uh, so let's get down to making a comic. Uh, is everybody ready? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's great. And uh, so the, what we thought we would do is I was going to start the prompt. And that's why I said, I know what's going to happen. Well, I know it's going to start the story, uh, but I have no idea how it's going to end. And every artist is going to get five to six minutes to continue the story however they want. So obviously this is gonna be very sketchy and fun and nobody really knows what's happening, but that's the fun of it. Uh, so let me pull up my very technical analog drawing tablet so you can all see. Um, this is just to hide the beginning of our story. And our story, for those who are excited to know, is this is our Comic-Con special and the story is called Haunted. So. I have created a character that I'm sure can be easily transformed into some way or other, but it appears to be some sort of spacefaring character. Uh, there's something that looks like rabbit ears, uh, and he or she is obviously very scared as hands are coming out towards him. Um, and so I'm just going to go to the next part of this story, <coughs> and we'll get a little bit closer starting with one spooky night and we see a haunted type mansion with a meteor coming down towards it. Uh, the story progresses uh, in a very literary way with a big slam sound effect where the meteor or the projectile has crashed. And finally, we have a character set coming from out of the wreckage and there's a little bit of fire. That character then starts to walk up the path away from the wreckage and towards that mansion uh, or castle. And then for my final panel, that character has now come up to the door of the castle. What happens is a mystery, except to Savannah, who's going to be drawing. And Savannah, I think you're going to be sharing your screen with yeah. us. Oh yeah, let me uh, do that right now. I think now. I'm going to start with uh, uh, Jeffrey, uh, and maybe this is a question that we can go down the path as we talk, but uh, you mentioned you worked on Star Wars, uh, so you worked on characters that were not necessarily your own. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your cartoon journey? Like, did you start, did you go to school for this? And, uh, and also, you know, what, what type of comics do you enjoy making? And, and does that tie in with having done licensed comics versus your own? That's that's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know. I kind of realized I was in over my head when I got going. So well, maybe. Yeah, just... well, I'll, I'll start, you know, so my my journey has been an interesting one. I, I grew up reading superhero comics and thinking that's that was my dream was to draw superhero comics when I when I grew up and um, then I kind of turned away from comics and thought I was going to be a fine artist, like a painter and doing, you know, art for museums and galleries and um, came to Chicago to go to the School of the Art Institute for my master's and realized that I wasn't having fun making art anymore. And so just, just to goof off, I started drawing comics again and haven't looked back. I started out doing some autobiographical, more adult comics and kind of lucked into the opportunity to do Star Wars, um, which was another childhood dream, drawing Star Wars all day for my, for my day job. And the great thing about working with licensed characters is it, it lets you practice a lot of storytelling without having to do all the work of the world building 
and um, or you know figuring out who the characters are and what their journeys are. You kind of have a lot already built, so you can just focus on what's happening to the characters. And so it was kind of a natural progression to go from there to to the books I've been doing more recently, like Space Time, where I have these these two characters, Petra and G Day, two human kids that get to explore the galaxy and come up with all kinds of alien and robot characters and you know kind of use use all the storytelling that I learned while working with with Star Wars and applying it to all new characters that that I've come up with on my own. That's great. I mean that that is definitely I like the idea of using other characters to build your storytelling skills. And uh, moving over to Sophie, uh, Sophie, could you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into comics, and then also maybe how you in, uh, incorporate, you know, your own experiences into even something, uh, you know, like uh, the story that you're telling right now with the witches? Um, yeah, sure. So. I kind of fell into into comics when I was very little because my my dad was a collector and I really grew up in a house like full of of graphic novel but the, you know the French and Belgian type of graphic novel like the big format and Asterix, Yakari, all all these guys, Franquin of course that's probably like the artist that really got me hooked to a graphic novel, André Franquin. He's the is the um, the creator of uh, the Marsupilami, Spirou et Fantasio. Gaston Lagaffe, of course, which is like the, the most beautiful uh, character ever, like uh, who introduced me like to uh, maybe some some kind of anarchy. Of, uh, anyway, so yeah, I grew up with with all this, uh, these graphic novels. And I always loved drawing from as far as I can remember, I've always been drawing. Um, but it, it kind of took me like years before really like, you know, um, having the 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 courage, I want to say, to to dive into, you know, it, at just try myself at, at making graphic novel for real. I've always done it for myself, but to really like try myself at the big long format, okay, like that's a 250 page like graphic novel. It kind of, yeah, I think it's me meeting uh, Kevi Sonak, who's my agent today, and also maybe having kids. So reconsidering like a lot of things in my life, what was the priority, what really, what I really wanted to do. And uh, yes, like a, an accumulation of circumstances that made like me wanted, really wanted to give it a try. And, uh, and the magic was that I was able to do it, you know, it really, really worked out fine. And um, yeah, now I, I never want to stop. That's, I want to do that for the rest of my life, really. Oh, fantastic. Well, I and I thought that was interesting. You mentioned your kids because I, I seems like that is a big uh, uh, indicator for a lot of people it, that can be the catalyst for a lot of different changes in life. And, and yeah. this one ties in and you can tell with your stories that you have a very realistic view of, you know, the the wonderful thing about kids and then also their imperfections. <laughs> so uh, and now moving over to uh, Rich. Uh, I am going to assume you don't live with a family of pigs, but I, I do know you have kids, so that might be an influence for you as well. And if you could tell us a little bit about your cartoonist journey. So yeah, I, I grew up I grew up on comics and graphic novels and that sort of thing. And I, I got syndicated in my 20s with Tribune Media Services in Chicago. And so I did a gag a day uh, comic strip for uh, five years with them. And I was in about 50 newspapers. It just wasn't enough to, you know, fuel the whole career sort of thing. So I became an animator for the last 10, 15 years. And then these guys um, kind of gave me insight into this world where, like, all of you guys are doing such great work. And I, I guess I was completely caught off guard by how much talent there was on this side of the fence. So um, I started going after trying to do a graphic novel and I, I ended up selling a series of three, so. So when you created your characters for Ham Helsing, uh, did they come up fully formed or did, you know, how did the story progress for you? Did you have an idea immediately of, oh, this is our three book series here or did it grow, you know, organically? 
you know, I, I, I really just had a feeling of like the main char characteristic of and journey, like it, as like a like an elevator pitch almost, like what it would what what this one character that he was a soft, gentle pig in a in a house full of really aggressive, toxic masculinity sort of other pigs, and that was really that conflict really drove the story. And yeah, I didn't really know exactly how book two and three were going to play out. I knew that I could, you know, get there. But to me, it was just about um, creating that fun conflict. And then I, I, I really just threw on uh, a lot of characters that complemented personalities. Um, right. Well, uh, and, and Sophie, uh, now you sometimes work with a partner uh, and you work with yourself. Like, do you feel that, uh, you know, do you just focus on the visual when you're when you're working with another creator or do you feel it's like a, a combined effort with with both the story and the art? Um, I think it's a combined effort. Uh, it's, uh, I, I really like, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's a game that I think we've all played somehow, you know, to kind of fell in love for a character of a book and like, oh, I want to give it a face, you know, I want to, try and see if I can draw the character that is like, you know, playing in my head. And uh, so I like the feeling. I love the feeling of meeting someone else's characters and, and bringing it to life on a page, you know, like adding details, like, you know, freckles, a crooked smile, like some, I think, yeah, I really like it. And it's a completely different feeling to, uh, you know, to work on some someone else's characters or to work on your own character. It's like, it's a different kind of voice talking in your head, I feel. Right, almost like a different set of muscles, I guess. You yeah. Know, one yeah. kind of exercise versus another. Yeah. And uh, and, and Jeffrey, how about you? Would, when you put together uh, the space-time story or uh, your, your Neanderthal kids, I mean, did you feel like, oh, I knew, I knew just the story I want to tell, or was it, was there some hit and miss there? I mean, it's always like, so I usually have some big ideas of like some general things. So like for the first space time book, I knew they were going to go to Mars and meet the other aliens. Um, but I didn't necessarily know, you know, even what all characters were going to go to Mars. So initially the character Toby, who becomes one of the main characters in the books, what he was just supposed to show up at the, you know, the kind of the prologue and, and never be seen again. And so I like to have a really good idea when I'm starting and then have enough room so that things can, can change and like go unexpected directions along the way. Great. And that's, uh, yeah, I think we've all had characters that surprised us. Um, and, uh, and, and also we've had times where I think uh, we'll get into some of the talk of, you know, editors, uh, because we all, uh, as, as creators working with publishers, have, have editors that we work with. And, uh, but I, I'm going to get into that in a minute. Uh, Savannah, how's it going? Okay. I am <laughs> finished. Let's look at you want to take us through from the start? Okay, I'm done. So the little guy goes in the castle and he's like, hello? And he's like, my ship crashed. I need some help. And then there's a big noise. And then what's the big noise? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I think I think Jeffrey's going to have to answer us on, on what that big noise is. Um, Jeffrey, you up to the task? I, I, I think I've got it. Okay, and you're drawing as I did on a on a uh, piece of. Is for those at home who don't know it, this is paper, and as <laughs> some of us still work on, and and uh, I I'm kind of a hybrid. Um, Jeffrey, do you do you work digitally or do you work only on paper, or what is your method? I still work pretty much all analog, so all my coloring is by hand, and um, still work on paper. I use Photoshop for sometimes correcting mostly like text mistakes and things. Um, but yeah, I try to, to, to work totally analog as much as possible, so. Okay, cool. Well, we'll let you get to it while we talk. Uh, Savannah, I know we've, uh, we've worn you out art-wise, but you're in the clear now. And uh, 
maybe I can ask you that question as well. Uh, analog versus digital. Uh, what's, what's your method when you're creating and is it the method you've always used? Well, when I was a lot younger, I used to do analog and, you know, I really loved the feel of it, but um, I really didn't like how um, I couldn't really edit what I was doing. And um, it does take a, lo a lot longer. Um, so I switched to full digital when I started working professionally. Um, Cause when I was like younger, I used to like put my work in like comic book stores in new Orleans and just like anywhere that would take them. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I kind of miss working traditionally though. I used to paint a lot and I don't really paint anymore. Uh, it's definitely like a tactile feeling that like, it's just completely different, you know? But um, I think, you know, for the sake of my sanity, I have to work digitally. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and and Sophie, uh, where where do you fall in that range? I'm mean, I'm I'm on the same page as Savannah. I mean, I I love ink, like real ink. Having my my fingers black, I love it. But you know, being a mother of three and having to you know run around the town, uh, you know, all the time, it's just without the iPad, I think I just couldn't couldn't do anything. I mean, I I couldn't finish anything. It's a long leaf technology. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I it's funny because I've often said to people I still work on the same iPad I purchased before I started Max Meow and I, I just the fact that I could carry it over to meetings uh you know in my day job and just I I was just saying to someone I have drawn so many pages outside of my son's basketball practice. You know, in yeah. The I hear you like same same in playground on playgrounds in like waiting rooms at the doctor everywhere yeah and uh how about you rich yeah i'm on the same page too i i i, I it took me you know i guess i've been doing digitally for at, at least 15 years but um it was weird at first right because it's this glossy finish and it feels slippery and it's mm. it doesn't have that grit and tooth that paper has and i i always love that but you know, control Z is an awesome tool. So like, you know, you can make a mistake, you can do, you can draw really fast. You can have actually three layers of sketches if you want to, which I really like that to do a rough rough and then a, a little tighter rough. And then, you know, by the time you get to something that you think you can run with, you could, you know, make the last pass with ink. And that that's something that is really hard to do. And I, I did animation for years and years and um, it cut days off the time, you know. Um, I mean, I used to love to go into coffee shops and even doing it without a traditional animation tool, but just like photocopy paper and like looking through the piece of paper underneath and stuff. I would do that herky-jerky sort of method just to get out of the house. But as soon as I went digital, I, I cut days or weeks off the time so mm -mm. hard to argue with that you know yeah 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 and um, again I'm going to go back to you again Savannah just because you were drawing the whole time and there there's some things going back to questions I was asking uh, specifically you're you're the uh, you did you're doing an adaptation of an existing novel and uh, I think for the people watching that is very different from maybe coming up with your own ideas. So maybe you can take us through some of those steps and what you like and don't like about that. Yeah, um, adapting a novel, it was really fun actually. Um, I'm, I, when I was a, a kid, like middle, middle school grade, historical fiction was like my favorite and I read like so much historical fiction and um, oftentimes I would like draw the characters from the book and like come up with like, you know, designs for them. And so like, I think it was something that I actually wanted to do for a really long time. Um, and then adapting it, it itself, um, uh, I was really lucky because Turtle in Paradise is, it's a very episodic book. Uh, all the chapters feel very self-contained and I was able to very easily adapt those smaller stories into small comic book stories and um, I really appreciated how Jenny really let me um, set my own pace and uh, she let me 
you know, basically do whatever I want. Like she was, she was really agreeable, and uh, yeah, I had a, re I actually had a really good time. There wasn't really anything about it that I disliked as far as the adapting goes. Um, I wrote, I wrote out a full script, and you know, I read the book like a lot, like so many times. Like <laughs> I don't, I don't even know how many times <laughs> I read it, so I know it back and front. But um. Yeah, uh, I think it was an, uh, definitely a unique experience adapting the book, but uh, one that I really enjoyed. Right, and that kind of ties in, uh, I won't bug Jeffrey while he's talking, just saying that yours is, and Sophie, there's a different set of muscles when it's someone else's uh, character, uh, and it, you get to sort of add to it. Uh, oh, yeah, um, sorry, I must have missed that. I was like so stressed out. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, absolutely. Um, I've worked with um, other like um, characters before, and but in a smaller in a smaller way. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I I really enjoy working with other people's characters too. Like yeah, it's it's definitely a different muscle because you kind of get to play with a world that somebody's already created versus like putting your own spin on it. But the nice thing about working on Turtle in Paradise is that it is historical so there was a lot of research so it was like playing with a world but like in realism <laughs> so <laughs> so uh there was a lot of research that went into it and that was really probably the biggest learning curve for me right that's great well let's head over to jeffrey and see how he's doing right now how's it going jeffrey that's good i now i wish i had like a gray sharpie like <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I know it's <laughs> uh, sometimes I can get a little bit of gray out of this, I guess, but only when, yeah, I it, then I'm usually in trouble when the gray starts popping up because that means oh, I'm no. running out of ink. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing, I just wanted the dramatic lighting. <laughs> there's nothing worse than drawing on stage with a Sharpie and then halfway through the drawing, it it just dies on you unexpectedly. Oh yeah, like I have, even though I'm not drawing right now, like I do school talks and I have like pens all over the place, right? <laughs> like within, so I just reach out and there's a pen, uh, a Sharpie for me. And I have like the big fat ones, but then- Yeah, I was about, those are serious I, Sharpies. Yeah, I was just gonna say, sometimes like the cap goes flying off and then I don't discover it till just before my next talk. And of course it's like a paperweight at that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, great. Well, Jeffrey, if you want to tell us what's happened so far, and so we'll get... as you remember, there was a noise crash, but it turns out it was just here. I don't know. Maybe you can get closer here. So um, there's a big crash, but as you can see, it was actually just a little little mouse running by, um, and and so our little rabbit explorer has decided that this place must be empty. Da, da, da. Yeah, spooky <laughs> looming guy, I love him. So here, setting it up. Okay, Yay. good job, good job. And and now we're gonna hand it off to Rich. Have, mm -hmm. Sophie, starting with you, is there ever a time where either your characters or your editor surprised you and, and changed the story for the, you know, in a in a good way mm, that's a good question i mean the way i'm the way i'm building stories in my head is really by like following my characters anyway so i guess they always surprise me somehow because uh, it's usually i mean that's the first thing that comes up in my head you know it's an idea it's the characters and then then the story, then they show me the stories, you know, then they're like, take me there and then introduce me to this and that, and then the story takes place. So yes, I guess, uh, I guess Silly Man really did surprise me a bunch of time. That's and, great. Uh, and I'm so that I'm sure Whitney is surprised. Oh yeah, definitely she did in the third book, but I cannot tell you. Because <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, how about you, Savannah? Yeah, absolutely. Um, not so much for Turtle, just because um, I think since it was an existing novel, it already had gone through so much editorial work and 
um, I think it was really polished. But um, for my first book, um, Bloom, which was um, from first, second, um, there was a lot of really awesome notes from our editors and definitely like major things changed for the better, I think, absolutely. Uh, um, it's like the ending, for example, was really sad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my editor was like, it shouldn't be sad, I don't think. And we were like, <laughs> okay, yeah, it shouldn't be sad. <laughs> so that was good. I, uh, I'm really happy with the ending though. And I'm glad that, you know, she pushed us to make it a happy ending. That's great. And is there, uh, am I right? There's a follow-up to Bloom coming out? That's yeah, it just got announced. Um, so I'll be working on that this year. I haven't started yet, but... Yeah, I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I'm excited too. I really oh, like the first one. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's like, it's uh, been in the talks for a really long time. So it was just so nice to like say that it's coming out. Like <laughs> it exists. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, Very thank cool. you. <laughs> um, okay, Jeffrey, uh, is there a time where your characters have surprised you or perhaps an editor or, you know, someone making a comment changed everything? Yeah, I mean all the time. I mean, that's why editors are so great. There's so many things that that you don't see or don't think of. Um, and one of the Lucy and Annie books, we actually rearranged four chapters. So I had to like reconfigure so much stuff um, because my editor was like, I think this, this chapter, like what's happening here should really go first. And it makes more sense to this. And I was like, that's so much work. To do and then I did it and I was like okay the story is so much better for doing all that work but um so there's been times like that but even just so many times where there's there's a little moment or a little joke or something that I put in and um my editor is really great at pointing out you know like is that does that really have anything to do with the story and um you know so, sometimes there's jokes that I've kept in I was like, no, but like it needs to stay. It makes sense for that to be there. And, um, but it's a good um, way to check yourself. And, you know, I think there's the, the old saying to, to, you know, I guess it's, is it kill your darlings? Like, yeah. you know, you, you know, if you're, I, I kind of follow that, that rule of, you know, it's, even if it's a great joke, if it, if it's, if it doesn't advance the story, then I really need to think about whether it needs to be there so that the only things that are left after editing are, you know, the really important, crucial stuff. Right. I, and I don't know if it was Stephen King that originated that phrase, but I do know that's where I learned it from. Uh, and he, uh, he did a great book on called On Writing that mm -hmm. sort of I, I thought was great because it talks about the fact that a lot of times it's just showing up. To get your work done, uh, you know it's it's not always easy. Um, okay, uh, how's how's it going, Rich? Just want to check in with you here. Uh, yeah, just uh, making it up as I go. So yeah, it's uh, going good, I think. Okay, great. Well, uh, and now uh, reaching out to everybody, um, maybe I can uh, like I'm trying to think of exactly how to how to phrase this, but. Uh, you know, I mentioned the fact that the, the amount of work uh, can sometimes be daunting uh, being a cartoonist. And, you know, what are some things that you do when you kind of hit a block? Because I, I know that a lot of the people watching may be at that point where they're, they've got ideas, they, they just can't get them out. Like what suggestions would you have to those people uh, either facing a, an artist or writer's block or, you know, just how to get yourself going in the, in the morning? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't pick anybody. How about Savannah? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, being creative all the time is just obviously going to be tiring. And not to mention drawing is just super laborious, like activity. You're just sitting hunched and, you know, <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. But so I like to, I mean, go for a walk. That's like the main thing. Um, I like to play with my dog. Just do anything else. And then, you know, I don't really work very well with like a lot of noise around. So I'll just like have to shut everything out if I really need to focus and break myself up into time frames. So I'll set like an alarm 
uh, it's just very, uh, it's kind of uh, boring and clinical, honestly, how I get myself to work. It's just sort of like, this needs to be done. So I like set some timers or be like, I need to finish five pages the first half of the day and then I'll, I'll do five more at the end. And so that's, that's basically it. But yeah, I mean, honestly, I got a dog last year. Oh, uh, last year uh, in 2020. That was last year, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, he really helped me because it like put me on a schedule and I never had that before because I would have to take care of him and do stuff for him. And so, yeah, I would say, you know, get a pet which is probably not great advice. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, everybody has their own. How about you, Sophie? What is, what are your things? And, you know, have you found that having a schedule helps or is, is there just no schedule? Let's just do it all the time. Um, it is really, I mean, I, I try to have a schedule, but uh, having a, a family of young kids make it like, you know, anything that you try to do, having three kids make it like twice more complicated and it's twice the time that it would take you if you didn't have the, the amazing kids so really it's like i'm i'm working where i can thank god they're going to school and uh, so i kind of yeah i definitely have a schedule it's like really tack 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 and i know that i can work from like nine until four and that's the window i have and no more so i have to fit like the four pages like when i'm inking four or five pages or if I'm like writing, it's uh, it's a bit trickier when you're in the process of really coming up with ideas and, and putting a story together because you can't really force yourself, you know, you're going to have an amazing idea right now. <laughs> That's not how it works. So in this case, when I'm at that stage, I, it's like, like you were saying, Seven, I just go out, take a walk, you know, go get an ice cream, put your head somewhere else. Usually right. it works. Thank you. Uh Jeffrey, uh, you know, how does that work for you as far as a schedule goes? And is there one part that's easier to do when things are, you know, tight as opposed to another part of the book? Like, is there a certain part of the book that you just have to shut yourself away? I mean, the, like the initial writing and plotting and ideas is always the hardest part. You know, the drawing is kind of the fun part and you kind of know what you're doing and, and it's all, it's just kind of the last leg to the finish but um yeah so schedule wise yeah it just i mean it depends on what stage projects are in but i try to you know once the kids are off to school get to work and tell their home and dinner time bedtime and then i um try to work at at night if i'm not too tired uh but i you know is in terms of you know no matter how long you've been writing or making books like you you're always going to run into points where you're kind of stuck or just feel like you're slogging through it and um so that yeah i i like to play pickup soccer um or just read a book and watch a movie but uh, you know the most the most important thing i found is just to remind myself not to panic that it's just a natural part of the process and um, <laughs> You know, it's okay to just relax and not force it and, you know, just have confidence that, you know, that eventually you'll, you'll get the right idea and then things will click and you'll, um, you'll hit that point where all of a sudden it's just, you know, it's just full speed ahead. And um, so that's the other side of it is just when it is, when, when you, when you, the inspiration does strike just to, to be ready for that, to just run with it. Um, how's it going, Rich? Uh, good. I, uh, I think I made too many panels. <laughs> that is a lot of panels. Uh, um, they look good, though. Yeah, they look awesome. I really yeah, love um, the transformation of the mouse down there. So w while you finish it, because we're kind of at the edge of that time there, can you just tell us uh, what's happening? All right, sure. Um, he is welcoming this mouse. There's the uh, forbidding figure behind him. And ah, so he's getting close mouse mouse eye view, I guess. And uh -huh. then he turns around. Mouse is still here. Fine as we go. <laughs> and then uh, close up on the eyes. Nice. And then he freaks out. Ah. Oh, I see. And then the mouse transforms. 
So, wow. <laughs> I really love the transformation of the mouth. That's incredible. I, when you were drawing it, I didn't know what that was exactly. And now looking at all the panels by in order, that's, that's sort of, uh, that's incredible. Okay. That's great. Okay, Sophie, it's your turn. Yeah. All you have to do is uh, make us wrap cry. up the story, honey. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> wrap it up. <laughs> that's, that's sure. And um, uh, you and know, then, as so far as Savannah, you talked about how you created a comic script from the book itself uh, with uh, uh, Turtle in Paradise. And are, are there any were there any times where you just ve veered from your own script? Um, very little time. There's only a few times where I maybe added a panel for a beat or um, I was really aware. I, I It depends on the project, but um, I wrote a full comic script um, for Turtle just because I knew it was going to be edited and I wanted it to be easy to read. <laughs> but if it's something that I'm only going to look at, so I'll just do dialogue. But yeah, um, there wasn't a lot of times I deviated from it every now and then maybe I would add a panel for a beat. And, but yeah, I think, you know, like Rich, I work very, like, um, I definitely think of stuff like cinematically. Uh, I have a, a BFA in film, but <laughs> But yeah, I think that uh, with, for, for Turtle in Paradise script, I didn't really, um, like the script was super helpful and I definitely used it. That's great. How about you, Jeffrey? Because uh, you're, you know, you mentioned you draw in analog and uh, I have, you know, raised my kids reading uh, some of your, you know, the Star Wars books that you worked on and also your new stuff. Do you, uh, how do you put it together? Do you draw out a comic page or do you start off with a script? Yeah, so I, it's lots of stages. So it starts out with just the general idea and then I just start formulating that into an outline and then I rework the outline over and over. And I'm as I'm reworking it, I'm starting to think about how it might break out into pages. And then I eventually I get to the point where I kind of have a page by page breakdown of what's gonna happen on every page from the outline. And then I start a first draft, which is just basically stick figures. Um, but I write and draw the whole book with this kind of stick figure draft. And, and the text is really messy. And sometimes, like if there's a lot of times where I don't know what the joke is gonna be. I know there's gonna be a joke somewhere and I might just write joke in the dialogue um, and no, I'll, I'll figure out a, a better joke later rather than trying to like get stuck figuring out just the right joke. Um, and then from that, most of the, the editing comes in that, after that first stick figure kind of thumbnail draft is done and that's where it's easy to kind of rework. But then I do a second draft that's that's a little rougher, maybe, maybe a little kind of about as rough as this was, um, but write and draw the whole book and then do another round of edits. And I, I like to do, even though that's a lot of work, um, for me, each of those times going through the entire book over and over gets me thinking about the story and instead of just editing one page and thinking about how that page is different, I'm thinking about it in the context of the whole story and I'm usually finding things that I didn't notice on previous readings of, of the, the rough draft. So um, it's, it's, in a way it's work, but it all pays off because then the final artwork um, usually just flies by because I kind of it's just the fun of doing the final drawings and all the story problems are figured out by then. Right. That's well. It is amazing too how you'll go back. Uh, you can go back and look in a story as a reader and see things you didn't notice before, and it's neat to hear that that happens as as the artist and author as well. Um, and, and Rich, going back to uh, a previous question, while you were drawing, we were talking about things you do to sort of get back on track or get yourself started, or when you hit a wall, what are, what are some things that you do that might help you with, with that process? Oh, you know, I, I was, my 
vice is my strength. So I, I was born with like lots of self-esteem and, and even when there's a bad idea, I roll with it. <laughs> so like, it's not the greatest thing. So usually it's identifying, like I can keep writing and, and, and pushing forward, but it's really identifying the gold, I think for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so I kind of work it out in process. If anything, I just try not to like, write so many pages that it just turns into work you know it turns into just trying to squeeze the lemon with no juice in it or whatever whatever the word analogy is but i i i do like when i was writing the script for ham i do like five script pages a day something like that five or ten and then i would try and stop just so um i wouldn't you know exhaust the inspiration i guess um I don't know, that, that, that's what works for me. I just, I try and set some boundaries about what's an achievable goal and not to exhaust myself with that. Even if I'm having a really great day, I just take the notes for tomorrow. Um, and that way the well's always full. That's. Yeah. Well, um, and, I, and so going to you, Jeffrey, and then we can carry this question to everybody. You know, you, you've done uh, several books that were parts of series. And one of the number one questions I get whenever I talk to schools, uh, which has been a lot recently, is, uh, are you planning on doing more? And because I, what I, I mean, definitely, I think we all know kids love book series right now. It's more fun. Uh, Harry Potter, Percy Jackson, uh, you know, the Smile books by Raina Telgemeier. So Jeffrey, uh, do you, you know, when you create it, are you always thinking of this as a series or have some of your ideas started as a single idea and turned into something yeah i mean i when once i started with with starting with jedi academy jedi the first jedi academy book was just a standalone and we didn't know if lucasfilm or would want to do another one or you know if it would do well enough to to turn into a series but we kind of left it open for that and then it worked out but by the third book, I was just, I was ready to do something different. And then the same thing happened with the Neanderthal series. And so I am, um, I feel like I, I like doing series, but at the same time, I, I like doing different things. And so um, I, I don't want to get burnt out. Do, you know, I, I can't imagine being, you know, one of the like authors who's doing like 10 books in a series. It just seems thinking about it that way is just overwhelming. And, um, and so I, you know, I kind of like to think of it as more contained and, and, you know, have an endpoint in sight for, for anything I do. Right. So, so Rich, you had mentioned there's a, a three book plan for Ham Helsing right now. And uh, again, I keep coming back to your, to your comic strip background. And, you know, there's creators there like Charles Schultz who drew peanuts for 50 years. And uh, do you see Ham Helsing as being a character you could be doing in 50 years? Or is, you know, have those days just uh, gone by for people because uh, the sort of wanting to do something different? You know, I, I want to do a variety of work. Not to say that if it sells that I wouldn't do that, I guess. I just want to figure out a way to manage multiple projects. Um, I think that's where it's at mostly. So if it if it takes off, I, I already have an idea for another book that I really want to do with Ham, but um, I wouldn't want to feel like I'm a slave to it, I guess, or feel like mm -hmm. you're just doing a project to keep the crank going. But like honestly, like if if people were buying it or happy with it, there's as long as I've got ideas for where the characters can go in a new place, I, I'm cool with it. I just want to figure out how do I do that and other cool stuff I want to do because I've got a long list of stuff that my editor hasn't seen and that that's like really close and you know I'm just biding my time because I don't want to freak her out if I show her too much stuff because <laughs> like <laughs> you should be working on your book what are you doing but uh yeah I I uh maybe well, that's kind of I, I answered your question kind of in the middle I I wouldn't mind um, doing it as long as it feels fresh, you know, I think that's yeah. cool. Well, and I know uh, the week that we're filming th this uh, talk, uh, they just discovered some, you know, lost strips by Charles Schultz of another 
idea he had for a comic strip. And I got, and then I'm reading an article and says he wanted to do an adventure strip as well. So for me, in a way, it's exciting to hear. He always had other ideas. And then another part of me sad because I would have loved to have seen, you know, not only an adventure strip, but maybe when he left the, the comic doing a, a graphic novel uh, of his own. And uh, of course they've created some great ones, uh, you know, with, with the Schultz Foundation. Um, but uh, so we're getting really close here, everybody. And uh, I think I'll just uh, go to, you know, one of my last questions, which is, uh, again, we may have some people that are aspiring to be creators. Uh, some of them may not be looking or maybe looking at middle grade graphic novels for the first time. Maybe they've been focusing on what is called mainstream in the comic shops. Uh, and I guess it would be asking you all, do you have any advice for these people and how to transition uh, and, and things that are different maybe from the, uh, the Random House graphic type books and what are perceived as traditional comic books? Uh, I'll go back to you, Rich, and see if you have any thoughts on that. You know, I, I think if you don't box yourself in, this, I, I don't think they're different mediums, really. I mean, there's there's certain things maybe that you don't want to do in front of a ten year old that's okay in a six for a sixteen year old or whatever. But like, I think everybody wants to read something that's compelling and fun and um, easy to read and pulls on their heartstrings or you know or scares them or keeps them on the edge of their seat. I mean, all those all those feelings are there whether you're eight or eighteen. So. To me, I think t don't talk down to your audience or don't think that you have to write for a certain age group. Write, write for yourself and let your editor tell you um, if you've crossed a line or if, you've, if, if you're speaking over their head or not speaking their language or whatever, because I think that authenticity of your own voice comes across on the page. And if you're trying to, so hard to meet an audience like you have a marketing hat on, um, it's gonna be way harder to succeed, I think. So just. Yeah. I, I would say just have fun and tell stories, you know? Great. How about you, Jeffrey? Do you have any feelings about that? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think um, I, I always, my ideas, I think always start with what, what I would, I, what I would want to read first. And, um, you know, the, the hardest times that I've had as a, as a, cartoonists have been when I get caught up in thinking about like the market and sales and what people are going to think of the book and the best books I've, I feel like I've done and the most fun I've had doing them is when I was just having fun making comics and which is really the the reason I went back to making comics from painting and and fine art was because when I was a kid drawing comics was fun and I wanted I want a drawing to be fun again. So, um, and I think if you, you know, there's no guarantee that any book will be successful if it is published or even if it will be published at all or that people will like it. Um, the really, the only thing you control can control is like making the best book you can. And so as long as you're focused on, on that, um, that's, that's the best you can do. And, and so that's what I would say, go, go do that. It's great. And uh, Sophie, it looks like you are uh, just about wrapping up there. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, I can keep going for hours, but I think we don't have hours. Uh, great. Well, do you want to take us take us through? Yeah. Uh, so we left with the little mask that had turned out into a, a gigantic uh, werewolf type of mouth. And our little rabbit is hasn't seen that that monster yet, but is uh, is scared by the armor there, and the the, the armor just like present him with a trail with uh, a glass of something, and he's like, you should really drink this, sir. And he's like, no, 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 I, I really should be on my way. I should really be gone. I should go. And the armor is like, I'm afraid. I must insist. And so he's just like, ah, what I got myself into. And he drinks it. And then he turns into a gigantic kind of monster himself. And they party together. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Yeah. Give yourselves all a round of applause. <laughs> so good. Um, 
Okay, so we made a cartoon, we made a comic. Uh, this has been the uh, Random House Graphic, Let's Make a Comic panel. And I wanna uh, thank all of the uh, contributors here, uh, Sophie Escobas, uh, Savannah Ganesho, Rich Moyer, Jeffrey Bound, and uh, let's all give it a wave and, and everybody go out and buy their books. These are some talented Yay! people <laughs> and they're telling some great stories. So thank you very much. Go Comic-Con. Yay, bye-bye. Hey, nice to meet all of you.